Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sampudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sampudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sampudasa Bhutang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami. It's wonderful to be here with all of you and all of you who are tuning in and our wonderful brother monks. Um, I cannot tell you how happy the two of us are to have this uh, beautiful family relationship um, with the whole fourfold assembly here at Clear Mountain. And, uh, and we love it when our brother monks come to visit uh, Karuna Buddhist Vihara, KBV, uh, down in uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains too, and, and the fourfold assembly are present. Um, <clears throat> There was a um, fair bit of reference in the introduction about my times in Thailand, and that really changed my life, uh, as you might notice. <laughs> and my son becoming a monk, uh, it, it came at a time uh, when he and I both were really uh, had our hair on fire about the spiritual path because of the sudden passing of my father. It really brought us um, face to face with mortality. I remember my son and I standing at the graveside after his body was buried and, and my son with tears said, he was a jazz musician at the time heading towards you know being a performing musician and um, in that moment he said, this is real and everything I've been doing is not. And the search uh, led him almost immediately to to Buddhism, and he was he realized he wanted to be a monk, but he hadn't found the tradition that really spoke to his heart yet. And he went to different monasteries, and he kept saying, "No, this this isn't it." And then he got to a Bayagiri Buddhist monastery, so you know who Ajahn Pasano is, and they were really just getting started there, and. David shows up, and uh, Ajahn Pasano needed a driver to drive around for three days to different things he was committed to doing, and David was his driver, and he asked him 100,000 questions. <laughs> and he said Ajahn Pasano had the patience to listen to all of that and answer his questions, and, uh, and there was more than that to it. He, he said, yeah, this is very close to what I've been looking for. But he said all of the stories that Ajahn Pasano and Ajahn Amaro were, were using, talking about, whereas how great it is in Thailand, and all coming from Thailand. So he's like, I want to go to Thailand. <laughs> and so um, his travels, I had this map of the world on my bedroom wall, and I was putting in pins every time I heard from him about where he was in the world. And he went to like all these different Ajahn Chah monasteries in England and Switzerland and Italy and everywhere he could find one. And uh, he kept saying, no, this isn't quite the place for me yet. And he finally gets to Thailand and he goes to Ajahn Ganha's monastery. Ajahn Ganha uh, trained with Ajahn Chah. He's actually Ajahn Chah's nephew. And um, from what, I, what we've been told, he had uh, profound insights at a very early age. It's the way Ajahn Pasano puts it. I mean, he's really been had this reputation of having taken the path all the way to the end um, for 50 years. And... Uh, my son gets there and he finally writes me a letter and says, 
this is it. And I'm kind of like, did it have to be like halfway around the world? You know, if you went any further, you'd be on your way back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but you know, you know how it is when you're a mom, maybe you don't, I'm not sure what your life is like, <laughs> but, but there's kind of this, okay, I want the best for him. And then I was really, really um, looking forward to visiting him there to find out more about this whole thing. What are these people like that he's living with? Is this good? Is, you know, is it a cult? Is it, you know? <laughs> and um, so I went and I stayed. Actually, he didn't stay at Ajahn Gunha's, uh, even though he was so uh, loving it, impressed by it. But he didn't, he didn't know Thai. And so it was hard to understand the fine details at that time. And, and so he w it was recommended he go to the International Monastery of Ajahn Chah. As you heard, he was ordained and lived there. So that's where I went to see him. And it was so great because as a mother of a monk, I had a lot of access to the monks. My son would bring them over. I stayed for a month the first time. and. Um, and my son couldn't meet with me alone. And I'm learning about all these rules, you know, and learning about how it goes. And I was just soaking it up because it was so amazing. I had never, I had wanted to simplify my life. I was doing high tech in Silicon Valley. It's not all that simple um, there. <laughs> like, how do you even do that? How do you, you know, and, um, and I really saw simplicity. Just the first, you know, kind of like, what do we really need as human beings? And it's, oh, food, clothing, shelter, medicine. Wow. And seeing how simple that was there in the jungle. Um, and then he would, he couldn't come to see me by himself, so he'd bring another monk. He'd bring a couple monks. He'd bring some that were like really new in the robes. He'd bring some that were like in the middle stages, you know, five to 10 years. And then sometimes he'd bring, you know, Ajahn Jayasaro because he was the abbot. And I got to know these folks and learn from them. And I asked 100,000 questions. <laughs> And they were patient. <laughs> and it was really so beautiful. And then being able to visit other, other master teachers also. Uh, my son would stay in different monasteries, and I'd go to visit them there, visit him there. And yeah, so much gratitude. So a few years ago, I met Ajahn Gana for the first time. Thanks to my bhikkhuni sister, we, were, we decided to go on pilgrimage. She had not been to Thailand before. And she said, I want to visit Ajahn Gana and I want to visit Ajahn Biak. And I had not met either of them. And we went to Ajahn Gana's monastery. And we were both bhikkhunis at the time. And we were kind of on a little bit of a reconnaissance mission to visit a lot of the places that I had been to before and some new places to see, well, are these monasteries ready for bhikkhunis or not? <laughs> you know, how's that going to go? So Ajahn Gunha had such wide, open, encouraging acceptance and love that we, we knew we'd want to come back again and again. And the second time I went to visit him, I, was, um, I didn't have my dearly beloved sister with me because um, there was also some other stuff involved in the trip that was different, uh, not, not um, related to the holy life. But visiting Ajahn Gunha at that time, I, I said to him, Lung Pa, um, I've been practicing what you told me last time. You know, what I want is to, is to realize Nibbana. What do I have to do now? And he just 
focused on convincing me to come and stay for a long time to learn the Dhamma until I understand from him. And it was such an interesting moment because there were about 50 lay people there, Thai, lay pe Thai folks, and he, he was talking to me and encouraging me to come for a longer period, and he was also saying to the crowd, yeah, everyone's welcome here. And when you look at the photos of that moment, the people in the background are kind of like, eh, who's this Bakuni? Because, <laughs> you know, and there's a lot of this in the air of it's not okay to be a Bakuni. And Ajahn Gunha is like, no, everybody's welcome here. And, um, and this is the right idea to want liberation, to really put our attention on that. That's, that's really the goal of, of our holy life, whether we're living it in robes or not, and, uh, or, or as lay practitioners, dedicated practitioners to the Dhamma. And then staying at his monastery longer later on, um, getting more teachings, so beneficial. And last year, we, we were there with, um, there were 26 of us in all on, on, a, on pilgrimage from our community. And um, our lay folks were very well trained. They made a very good impression. It was, like, <laughs> it was very, very sweet. Um, and he invited the, the nuns to come up stairs at his kuti so he could talk to us and uh, there were four of us uh, three bhikkhunis and a seminary and he said you know I'm bringing you up here just like Ajahn Sumedho would bring the the abbots or the senior monks together to teach them how to teach or what to say and so he said teach people Teach yourself 100% and teach others 100%. And a little later on, he talked to us for quite a while. He said, teach yourself 100% and teach others uh, maybe 80%. Because, <laughs> you know, how much goes in there is really up to others, whatever, whatever they want to do, right? So, um, you know, everything he talked about is something you probably already know. But the emphasis was so powerful. He said, don't take the sense of self as the basis for life. Take the Dhamma as the basis for life. When you take the sense of, when people take the sense of self as the, as the basis for life, they fight with each other. When, the, when, we take the base, when we take the sense of self as a basis for life, then we get caught up in material things. And he said, even though there's all this science and technology in the West, um, people get lost in that. Um, and, and we need, if we take the, the, the Dhamma as the basis of life, he said, then you love everyone. And he really emphasized, love everyone. And really it is all beings, love all beings, just like it is in that chanting that we had a minute ago, you know, it's like, or 25 minutes ago. But <laughs> you know, really, really love everyone. And, and, to, and to really be selfless, to really do everything as a gift. He said, you know, Tell people, don't go to work thinking someone's making you do something. Go to work thinking, this is my gift. This is my gift to the people I work for. This is my gift to the people who benefit from this work that I'm doing. This is a gift. He said, when you study, don't feel like you're studying because you're made to study. It's like you're studying as a gift. Do all the work you do as a gift, whether it's washing the dishes at home or... Whatever it is, taking a dog for a walk, you know, this is a gift. 
live in a way that comes from selflessness. And I feel like in this community, there's so much of it. I mean, I feel so much kindness here. And this, this has to be the basis of our life, um, to be kind, to be generous, to live at peace. And he's, he's, he really, he was aiming, a lot, I feel, aiming a lot of this at me because I was a senior one there. And he's like, go, go and teach this. And he said, you can teach people from all religions about this. Because he said, all religions have the same fundamental purpose. And if they're fighting with each other, they're not coming from the, that's not the real religion. So the real religion is Dhamma. Because Dhamma is not Buddhist. It's the natural way things are. And so much of the wisdom of the Dhamma is known everywhere. I remember it from my childhood, living in a totally fundamentalist Christian environment. So much of the Dhamma just comes through. Hey, what goes around comes around. Yeah, that's Kama. <laughs> you know, our neighbor, oh, I'm not going to go there. Never mind. OK, maybe I'll go there. I just remember this from my childhood, you know, like uh, my dad said that some of the guys, they're farmers. and. Uh, they're talking about this one guy in the community who was having an affair with somebody else's wife. And this neighbor of ours said, yeah, not me. I'm just going to keep plowing the same furrow. <laughs> There's a lot of wisdom there, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, you know, because you know what's unwholesome. You know what leads to trouble. You know what leads to hurting yourself and others. And... And yet, we have to keep remembering. And so, there's this super strong emphasis from Ajahn Ganha about moral virtue, sila. And I, I keep finding more and more as I practice, is there's so much there that's, that's, there's so much value in really having an unwavering dedication to sila just beautiful, um, beyond our wildest imagination, really. I'm just going to briefly tell you this, this story. Um, and forgive me if you've heard it before, but I have this um, family member. He's actually married to my cousin. And I was pumping him for the whole story about this last January when I went back home. And, Indiana for a funeral and he I actually got to record him talking about it he's like my age a little older uh, and he was graduating from high school in 1968 and he said that there were, when you were graduating uh, there were three options you could either go to college or go to Canada or go to Vietnam and he said I wasn't college material he said he had never been north of, like, the next small town <laughs> north of where he lived. And so I didn't know how to get to Canada. <laughs> so I was going to go to Vietnam. And they were about to draft him, so he enlisted. And he was in basic training. He was in the infantry. And he said in basic training, he had this vision of himself, because he's learning how to use a rifle and, you know, all this he said he had this image, his vision of himself sitting in a tree and shooting someone in the head, shooting an enemy soldier in the head. And he said he could see the hole like a baseball size. And he said, I can't do that to anyone. I don't care who they are. And so his prayer, he's a very devout Christian. His prayer from then on was, may I not kill anyone. May I not have to fire my weapon? And he said he was praying that, for that all the way, you know, on the flight to Vietnam. Uh, he said his mother was praying for him. His pastor was praying for him. But, of course, they were praying that he not get killed. He was praying, may I not kill anyone? And he got there, and um, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember this, but... Uh, the battle on Hamburger Hill had just 
happened and a lot of forces were lost. And so when his plane of, of fresh re soldiers got there, they wanted the first 50 of them who got off the plane to join the 101st Air Airborne Division which is known to have been a really tough crowd. They were on the front lines constantly in the jungle. And he was one, Harry was among that group. And he said he had no training, you know, and that they had no training for, no, didn't know anything about parachutes or anything like that. But he turned out to be one of the men, you may have seen these photographs sometimes of a helicopter kind of almost landing on the top of a hill in the jungle and these men jumping out um, to fight. So he was one of those. He said the helicopter would have six guys on it and they'd get flown over to whatever place they're supposed to go and they get out and they're supposed to fight. But when he was sent out, other helicopters would go to other sites, but the place where he went, there's no enemy here. Okay, no fighting. And the next time he was sent out, he was sent to one of those other places where there had been fighting on, on those hills. But the place he got sent, there was no enemy there. Like, no one. It happened every time for six months. And he's fallen asleep on the ride over and the other soldiers are going, hey, how can you be asleep? And Army intelligence says there's confirmed 1,200 enemy troops on that site. He's like, there's nobody there. And there was nobody there. He flew 27 missions in 11 months. Nobody was ever there. Any which way they sent him, he said he had a reputation, like a couple hundred guys in this camp. Um, and he'd hear them talking about him, you know, like, that's the guy. That's Harry. Stick with him. <laughs> <laughs> he said literally some new guy would come and the other guys would say, hey, you want to survive Vietnam? Stick with Harry. He goes down the hill to eat his sea rations. You go down the hill, sit next to him, eat your sea rations. He goes out there to take a dump. You go out there. Harry's like, no, 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 I'm not into that. <laughs> but he said, yeah, as long as they were in his, in his, uh, his group, it, they were safe. And then they'd get transferred to another group, and they'd have to fight. He was sent to patrol the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which is like, the major, it's I-5 of, you know, Vietnam for the, for the Viet Cong, and uh, nothing there, no one. How's that possible? So at the end, at 11 months, a new commander took over, and he said, I'm going to show you what a nice guy I am. I'm going to send the guy who's been out here the longest back to base camp. He'll never have to come to the jungle again. And the other guy said, well, that's Harry. You can't take him. They had a petition. Over 200 guys signed this petition to keep Harry in the, in the front lines. And, and uh, the commander's like, a petition? What? Rips it up. Get on that plane. Or helicopter, I guess it was. So Harry got sent back to base camp. Three weeks later, Harry's still in base camp, and the same commander is there, comes, to, comes there for some business, and he walks past Harry, and he's like, you know, I'm just about this close to believing your BS story, because ever since you left, there's been nothing but combat. <laughs> he said when he was on the front lines, and he was, you know, in the camp, and he, his his uh, office pl platoon officer would come by, and he'd pick up his rifle, and he'd shoot it into the air. And Harry's like, what are you doing? He said, I'm getting the rust out of your barrel. You never shoot this thing. So Harry got sent home, and they mailed him the Bronze Star, because if, you if you're in more than 25 miss missions, you automatically get the Bronze Star. And he says, I'm a little ashamed of that, because I didn't do anything. 
to learn that. He goes to the to the VA hospital for something, and and uh, they they say you got any PTSD, and he's like, nope. So how does this happen? Harry's belief is that you know his prayers, God really kept kept him safe, and you know from a Buddhist perspective, yeah, he had some powerful devas <laughs> helping out, but how does that happen? My guess, lifetimes of not killing. Lifetimes of that commitment to not killing. This is kind of an how powerful these precepts are. They say, you know, you keep the precepts, the precepts will protect you. No kidding. And when people ask these questions like, yeah, would you lie if you were saving someone's life? I think if you're committed to not lying, no one ever comes to ask you something you'd have to lie about. Just keep the precepts and love everybody, 100%. And this gives us all we need to work with, to work through in our own hearts, because we all have challenges. We all have, you know, aversion arise. We all have temptations to, you know, do things outside the precepts. We all have all this conditioning we have to work with. And that is not where we're going. Where we're going to go is use the tools. The Buddha gave us so many wonderful tools. And now in a wonderful community where when we run into trouble, we can talk to people who will help us. Thank goodness we're not all kind of half falling off the cliff at the same time. We can reach over and pull each other up. You know, say, <laughs> you clear mountaineers, you, you got this. <laughs> So that's what I wanted. Well, I don't know if that was what I wanted to share. That was all just kind of like whatever came up. But I love you, and I respect this community so much. Thank you. Antamayang tamakataya satu karang katamase satu Sadhu, sadhu, anumodhami. So we have uh, time for questions or anything people would like to discuss. Just raise your hand and Mila will run the mic over to you and maybe say your name before you ask. And if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand or type it into the chat. Just take this opportunity. We have the eyes here for one day. Hello, everyone. I'm Blake. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I deeply appreciate what you, what you uh, shared today. And, uh, uh, and yeah, I, I've been attending here not too long, but I, I've found just trying my best to think about the five precepts and little little by little, but see if I can hold them more with more conviction. Uh, it, it seems to be bringing a lot of stability and well-being in my life, and I, I, I really appreciate that. The question I have, I've, I've been having this question for a little bit, and maybe I'll just kind of show off my novice uh, my novice, my na naivety or whatever. What what does sadhu mean, and how can we? What about how? Like, what internal posture should I be holding when I'm I'm saying I've been kind of treating it as like a thank you or gratitude? But uh, please, any any uh, advice or wisdom? Thank you. From from what I gather, sadhu means yes, <laughs> yes. And I like that. Um, thank you and gratitude. And I think it's all of that. Um, it's an acknowledgement of the, the beauty of what we're being given. And that generosity comes from so many directions, right? From the Dhamma, from the Buddha. Oh my goodness, what he did. And from everyone who's been carrying those beautiful teachings down for the millennia and, you know, the monastics and laity, we all have to work together to help this flourish, and I think it's all that. So, yeah, you got it.
so being on the path of loving everyone. Um, and then you also mentioned aversion arises. And so uh, if you encounter someone whose behavior is unpleasant and aversion arises, I'm just wondering, could you speak to that experience of, like, does aversion eventually fade away as you're on the path of loving everyone, or is it still there, but it doesn't matter anymore? Or what was, what's that like in your experience? I think the most important ingredient there that I didn't mention is wisdom. Because sometimes that aversion arises just because we have certain conditioning, certain um, kind of perceptions about people or beings. But sometimes it arises because that other person is behaving in really unwholesome ways. And there, that's where we need wisdom. We need to be clear about what's wholesome and what's unwholesome. And the Buddha said, actually, when there's unwholesome behavior, it's appropriate to feel disgust. And so, you know, sometimes when we talk about things like loving everyone, it feels like, oh, then I should just be endlessly giving and be a doormat and take whatever comes along, and I should be living with this abusive partner and let them, you know, whatever or whatever. And, and it's like, no, no, that's not wise. And the Buddha said, if you're in a situation where people are acting on in unwholesome ways you can love them and get the way out, get the heck away <laughs> you know as they get stay away from that um, when possible and look at how to um, protect yourself uh, and your precepts and with that wisdom and clarity that helps us to be able to let go of the aversion because a lot of times aversion, or even hatred or anger arises because it feels like that's what we need to protect ourselves. And so when we get that sorted out, like I don't need that to protect me, what I need is the wisdom. And Ajahn Gunha will say, you know, wisdom solves the problem. You know, and so you learn when is it okay to stay in a situation? When is it really more important to leave this situation? And the Buddha was brilliant because he didn't talk about all the different kinds of situations you might be in where there's, you know, a reason, a really good reason to leave. He just talked about what's going on in your heart. Are my wholesome qualities increasing and my unwholesome qualities decreasing? If that's happening, st you can stick with it. If my unwholesome qualities are increasing and my wholesome qualities are decreasing, he said, that's time to leave. So, you know, it's really great because most of us, maybe all of us, are unwholesome sometimes, and we need to learn, and we need to kind of get sorted with that, and people can change, thank goodness, and we're all, we're all on a path of change because we're not going to be the same way when we're enlightened as we are now. Or maybe you're already there, I don't know. I'm not trying to make any assumptions, but it's like... We, we want to be able to change. And if we're on the path, we should be looking for how to refine our behavior, how to refine our ways of thinking, our, our um, you know, conditioning gets refined. But until that time, um, developing this wisdom is so important. And using that wisdom to make clear and good decisions and maintain that loving kindness, that love in this case is without attachment. When you love everybody, it's without attachment, without even expectations. It's, it's, a, it's a way of loving even those people who are so close to us um, that is completely freeing. What you, <clears throat> what you just said really struck for me. 
I know that you can speak as a spouse and a parent and a grandparent, and yet unwholesome situations develop, and you cannot just get away because that abandonment will cause more problem. How do you stay close, still stay as loving as you need to? How do you convert that, that reaction to the unwholesome into something that can still be generous? What is that like for you? Yeah, I'm going to answer this one, and then I'm hoping to pass the mic around more, um, if that's OK. But as we develop in our practice, we need to develop the equanimity and the, the wisdom around what we really think we are, the wisdom around impermanence, the wisdom around the fact that we don't have ownership of any of these people in our life. My children are not mine. My grandchildren are not mine. Um, being married to someone does not mean they're mine. When I'm able to really get, get at a deep level that these living beings are passing through and I'm passing through and I, I do what I can do to support them. Like you said, you just don't walk away when it's someone. So I feel like, yeah, my parents, my children, my grandchildren, I feel like I have certain responsibilities in those relationships that I don't have with other people. I want to show up. I try to show up for my grandkids. It may be a little different than what other monastics might do, but I go to my granddaughter. She loves musical theater, and I go and watch her perform. I'm not there for entertainment, I can tell you. <laughs> but I go, sometimes I go to my grandson's baseball game. I, mean, I don't care about baseball, but I care about him. And I'm the grandma. That's, that's, a, that's something good for me to do for them. So you do things for them. And when they make oh, really decisions that you know are going to leave them, lead them to a lot of suffering, hopefully you've established a relationship where they'll ask you what you think. But if they don't ask you what you think, don't. No unsolicited advice. You try. I try. <laughs> And, and realizing that they're not mine. They, ha they have their own path. Maybe that mistake is going to help them in the long run. You know, just try to be a good example and, and work with all of the attachment, all of the, you know, like believing I know better, all of the, you know, wanting to, to tell them what they should do. Um, that's part of my practice, what I have to work with purifying in myself. And when we do that, a lot of times, eventually, they want to come and know what you think. And they might follow your example. Yeah, we can uh, call on the person on Zoom. White shirt, top left. We can't quite see your name, I'm sorry. Oh, Abhijano, please. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you, Aya, so much for your wisdom and your, uh, uh, your guidance. We appreciate you so much. But this is just in response to the first question about Satu. Uh, I just wanted to share uh, Ajahn Brahm's uh, interpretation of Satu, and that is, Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome. <laughs> um, I have a question for really any of you. Um, I have been doing a lot of studying up on love without attachment, um, as you were talking about. Um, I, I guess my question is, what advice would you give somebody who has problems with, um, 
I suppose the best way to phrase it is loving too much, literally anybody and everybody. <laughs> like, um, I have a lot of problems with, um, I'll be dealing with my own issues and be trying to pay attention to myself, um, but I'll see that somebody else is struggling and it doesn't matter if I'm even close to them, if I recognize them as another soul, then I, I, like, I feel in such a strong inclination to help that I will push away everything that I know I need for myself in order to help that person because I just, I, I don't know. I think I have issues with watching people stuff, suffer because um, I've gone through a lot of suffering and I know that I wouldn't have been able to get out of it without the great, without the immense amounts of help that I've had from my peers. So I, um, yeah, how, how does one still offer that um, love and support while also supporting themselves and being aware of their own like emotions and needs and stuff like that. It's a really, really good question and it's something that many, many people um, have challenges with. And I think the thing we wanna try to develop is that that sense of selflessness that sees this being as equal with all other beings in our uh, acceptance of generosity and kindness. So we have to take care of this being that you are. You have to take care of this being as much as you would take care of other beings with that equanimity and selflessness. And what that means is when what we want to try to develop are the, the four divine abidings, the, the loving kindness, which is completely um, selfless and, and filled with, you know, you, these divine abidings are, are like what the Davids experience. You know, this is like, there's no sadness in it. So when you get to compassion, which actually is a very unfortunate word, but all of the English words that you can use to translate karuna, they're all kind of bent the wrong way. Compassion means to suffer with, and that's not what the devas do. You're, you're aware that the suffering is there. You really want to help. I mean, your expression of wanting to help is so beautiful. But we want to develop that, that divine abode uh, for ourselves that we can then offer to others too. And in that, you don't suffer with. The Buddha said you can't really help someone else get out of the quicksand if you're standing in it. So we want to really strengthen that part of ourselves that can see the suffering and respond, but also be as equally aware of what our own body and mind need and hopefully learn and develop a network so that we can connect those people that we, we can't really help directly ourselves right away with other resources so that we're not like really draining ourselves. And, and what I have seen in myself and others is it seems to me that when we are suffering with there's something unhealed inside. And I think almost all of us can recognize there are some parts that are not yet healed inside ourselves. And so we want to turn and we want to work with that healing to really get to a place where we're on solid ground. But that doesn't mean we don't help others. In the meantime, it just means we give ourselves the same consideration and not feel like that's selfish Try to do it from a, a place of mindfulness, a place of keeping the metta going, and also equanimity, that we're really, really even in our expression. I mean, the other kinds of words that you can translate or involve in karuna are things like pity, pity which is kind of a looking down upon, or um, 
what's the other one? Um, oh, sympathy. Uh, there's, there's another one that sometimes. Mercy. Thank you, Matthew. Mercy, which that one comes from like asking for, um, you know, like the the boy cried out for mercy, you know, from the person who was about to beat him. You know, it's just, those are situations where somebody has the authority or the power to really harm you and they have mercy on you. I mean, this is so warped. You know, so I don't know what English word we can use for karuna, but it's a position of really seeing the suffering without suffering. We're coming from a place of wholeness. Caring for sure. Caring, yeah. So anyway, just kind of having those kinds of things in the back of your mind. Seeing if you can be... Um, I know I'm always kind of like ho looking for what are the resources I can point, point people to that can help. You know, a lot of times there are things I'm not trained to help with and I'm not, I, I'm not experienced enough with. And if I can uh, try to point people to something uh, that can help them, that's, that's the maneuver. Yeah. You're so lucky to be in this community. You know, you can probably... You know, like talk to friends who here who might be able to pitch in. Oh, yeah, thank you. And we we actually do have to start wrapping things up. But would before we do, um, would you, since neither you or Ayajitananda are going to be here uh, next week for our community celebration, would you have any words of encouragement um, or advice for our community going forward, or us? <laughs> oh wow well one thing for sure is we would love to be here next weekend but we can't and our hearts will be here um, supporting the amazing vibrancy of this community and um, it just feels like it's all so on the right track all I can say is really just keep going, keep doing the things you're doing, pitching in, getting involved, um, you know, continuing to be humble and kind and eager to change in the right direction.